Story The Heartless Husband. In olden times, Hanchow was the capital of southern China, and for that reason, a great number of beggars had gathered there. These beggars were in the habit of electing a leader, who was officially entrusted with the supervision of all begging in the town. It was his duty to see that the beggars did not molest the townsfolk, and he received a tenth of their income from all his beggar subjects. When it snowed or rained, and the beggars could not go out to beg, he had to see to it that they had something to eat, and he also had to conduct their weddings and funerals. And the beggars obeyed him in all things. Well, it happened that there was a beggar king of this sort in Hanchow by the name of Jin, in whose family the office had been handed down from father to son for seven generations. What they had taken in by way of beggar's pence they had lent out on interest, and so the family had gradually become well-to-do, and finally even rich. The old beggar king had lost his wife at the age of fifty. But he had an only child, a girl who was called, Little Golden Daughter. She had a face of rare beauty and was the jewel of his love. She had been versed in the lore of books from her youth up, and could write, improvise poems and compose essays. She was also experienced in needlework, a skilled dancer and singer, and could play the flute and zither. The old beggar king above all else wanted her to have a scholar for a husband. Yet because he was a beggar king the distinguished families avoided him, and with those who were of less standing than himself he did not wish to have anything to do. So it came about that little golden daughter had reached the age of eighteen without being betrothed. Now at that time there dwelt in Hanchow, near the Bridge of Peace, a scholar by the name of Mosu. He was twenty years of age, and universally popular because of his beauty and talent. His parents were both dead, and he was so poor that he could hardly manage to keep alive. His house and lot had long since been mortgaged or sold, and he lived in an abandoned temple, and many a day passed at whose end he went hungry to bed. A neighbor took pity on him and said to him one day, The beggar king has a child named Little Golden Daughter, who is beautiful beyond all telling. And the beggar king is rich and has money, but no son to inherit it. If you wish to marry into his family, his whole fortune would in the end come to you. Is that not better than dying of hunger as a poor scholar? At that time Mosu was in dire extremity. Hence, when he heard these words he was greatly pleased. He begged the neighbor to act as a go-between in the matter. So the latter visited the old beggar king and talked with him, and the beggar king talked over the matter with little golden daughter, and since Mosu came from a good family and was, in addition, talented and learned, and had no objection to marrying into their family, they were both much pleased with the prospect. So they agreed to the proposal, and the two were married. So Mo Su became a member of the beggar king's family. He was happy in his wife's beauty, always had enough to eat and good clothes to wear. So he thought himself lucky beyond his deserts, and lived with his wife in peace and happiness. The beggar king and his daughter, to whom their low estate was a thorn in the flesh, admonished Mo Su to be sure to study hard. They hoped that he would make a name for himself and thus reflect. Glory on their family as well. They bought books for him, old and new, at the highest prices, and they always supplied him liberally with money so that he could move in aristocratic circles. They also paid his examination expenses. So his learning increased day by day, and the fame of it spread through the entire district. He passed one examination after another in rapid succession, and at the age of 23 was appointed Mandarin of the district of Wu Wei. 
He returned from his audience with the emperor in ceremonial robes, high on horseback. Mosu had been born in Hanchow, so the whole town soon knew that he had passed his examination successfully, and the townsfolk crowded together on both sides of the street to look at him as he rode to his father-in-law's house. Old and young, women and children gathered to enjoy the show, and some idle loafer called out in a loud voice. The old beggar's son-in-law has become a mandarin. Mosu blushed with shame when he heard these words. Speechless and out of sorts, he seated himself in his room. But the old beggar king in the joy of his heart did not notice his ill humor. He had a great festival banquet prepared, to which he invited all his neighbors and good friends. But most of the invited guests were beggars and poor folk, and he insisted that Mosu eat with them. With much difficulty Mosu was induced to leave his room. Yet when he saw the guests gathered around the table, as ragged and dirty as a horde of hungry devils, he retired again with disdain. Little Golden Daughter, who realized how he felt, tried to cheer him up again in a hundred and one ways, but all in vain. A few days later Mosu, with his wife and servants, set out for the new district he was to govern. One goes from Hanchow to Wu Wei by water. So they entered a ship and sailed out to the Yangtze Qiang. At the end of the first day they reached a city where they anchored. The night was clear and the moon rays glittered on the water, and Mosu sat in the front part of the ship enjoying the moonlight. Suddenly he chanced to think of the old beggar king. It was true that his wife was wise and good, but should heaven happen to bless them with children, these children would always be the beggar's nephews and nieces, and there was no way of preventing such a disgrace. And thus thinking a plan occurred to him. He called little golden daughter out of the cabin to come and enjoy the moonlight, and she came out to him happily. Men servants and maid servants and all the sailors had long since gone to sleep. He looked about him on all sides, but there was no one to be seen. Little Golden Daughter was standing at the front of the ship, thinking no evil, when a hand suddenly thrust her into the water. Then Mosu pretended to be frightened, and began to call out, My wife made a misstep and has fallen into the water. And when they heard his words, the servants hurried up and wanted to fish her out. But Mosu said, She has already been carried away by the current, so you need not trouble yourselves. Then he gave orders to set sail again as soon as possible. Now who would have thought that owing to a fortunate chance, Sir Hu, the Mandarin in charge of the transportation system of the province, was also about to take charge of his department, and had anchored in the same place. He was sitting with his wife at the open window of the ship's cabin, enjoying the moonlight and the cool breeze. Suddenly he heard someone crying on the shore, and it sounded to him like a girl's voice. He quickly sent people to assist her, and they brought her aboard. It was little golden daughter. When she had fallen into the water, she had felt something beneath her feet which held her up so that she did not sink. And she had been carried along by the current to the river bank, where she crept out of the water. And then she realized that her husband, now that he had become distinguished, had forgotten how poor he had been, and for all she had not been drowned, she felt very lonely and abandoned and before she knew it her tears began to flow. So when Sir Hu asked her what was the matter, she told him the whole story. Sir Hu comforted her. You must not shed another tear, said he. If you care to become my adopted daughter, we will take care of you. Little Golden Daughter bowed her thanks. 
But whose wife ordered her maids to bring other clothes to take the place of the wet ones, and to prepare a bed for her? The servants were strictly bidden to call her, Miss, and to say nothing of what had occurred. So the journey continued and in a few days' time Sir Hu entered upon his official duties. Wu Wei, where Mo Su was district Mandarin, was subject to his rule, and the latter made his appearance in order to visit his official superior. When Sir Hu saw Mo Su he thought to himself, What a pity that so highly gifted a man should act in so heartless a manner. When a few months had passed, Sir Hu said to his subordinates, I have a daughter who is very pretty and good, and would like to find a son-in-law to marry into my family. Do you know of anyone who might answer? His subordinates all knew that Mo Su was young and had lost his wife. So they unanimously suggested him. Sir Hu replied, I have also thought of that gentleman but he is young and has risen very rapidly. I am afraid he has loftier ambitions, and would not care to marry into my family and become my son-in-law. He was originally poor, answered his people, and he is your subordinate. Should you care to show him a kindness of this sort, he will be sure to accept it joyfully, and will not object to marrying into your family. Well, if you all believe it can be done, said Sir Hu, then pay him a visit and find out what he thinks about it. But you must not say that I have sent you. Mo Su, who was just then reflecting how he might win Sir Hu's favor, took up the suggestion with pleasure, and urgently begged them to act as his go-between in the matter, promising them a rich reward when the connection was established. So they went back again and reported to Sir Hu. He said, I am much pleased that the gentleman in question does not disdain this marriage. But my wife and I are extremely fond of this daughter of ours, and we can hardly resign ourselves to giving her up. Sir Mosu is young and aristocratic, and our little daughter has been spoiled. If he were to ill-treat her, or at some future time were to regret having married into our family, my wife and I would be inconsolable. For this reason everything must be clearly understood in advance. Only if he positively agrees to do these things would I be able to receive him into my family. Mosu was informed of all these conditions, and declared himself ready to accept them. Then he brought gold and pearls and colored silks to Sir Hu's daughter as wedding gifts, and a lucky day was chosen for the wedding. Sir Hu charged his wife to talk to little golden daughter. Your adopted father, said she, feels sorry for you, because you are lonely, and therefore has picked out a young scholar for you to marry. But little golden daughter replied, it is true that I am of humble birth, yet I know what is fitting. It chances that I agreed to cast my lot with Mosu for better or for worse. And though he has shown me but little kindness, I will marry no other man so long as he lives. I cannot bring myself to form another union and break my troth. And thus speaking the tears poured from her eyes. When Sir Hu's wife saw that nothing would alter her resolve, she told her how matters really stood. Your adopted father, said she, is indignant at Mosu's heartlessness. And although he will see to it that you meet again, he has said nothing to Mosu which would lead him to believe that you are not our own daughter. Therefore Mosu was delighted to marry you. But when the wedding is celebrated this evening, you must do thus and so, in order that he may taste your just anger. When she had heard all this, little golden daughter dried her tears, and thanked her adopted parents. Then she adorned herself for the wedding. The same day, late at evening, Mosu came to the house wearing golden flowers on his hat, and a red scarf across his breast. Riding on a gaily trapped horse, 
and followed by a great retinue. All his friends and acquaintances came with him in order to be present at the festival celebration. In Sir Hu's house everything had been adorned with colored cloths and lanterns. Mosu dismounted from his horse at the entrance of the hall. Here Sir Hu had spread a festival banquet to which Mosu and his friends were led. And when the goblet had made the rounds three times, serving maids came and invited Mosu to follow them to the inner rooms. The bride, veiled in a red veil, was led in by two maid servants. Following the injunctions of the master of the ceremony, they worshipped heaven and earth together, and then the parents-in-law. Thereupon they went into another apartment. Here brightly colored candles were burning, and a wedding dinner had been prepared. Mosu felt as happy as though he had been raised to the seventh heaven. But when he wanted to leave the room, seven or eight maids with bamboo canes in their hands appeared at each side of the door, and began to beat him without mercy. They knocked his bridal hat from his head, and then the blows rained down upon his back and shoulders. When Mosu cried for help he heard a delicate voice say, You need not kill that heartless bridegroom of mine completely. Ask him to come in and greet me. Then the maids stopped beating him, and gathered about the bride, who removed her bridal veil. Mosu bowed with lowered head and said, But what have I done? Yet when he raised his eyes he saw that none other than his wife, little golden daughter, was standing before him. He started with fright and cried, A ghost, a ghost. But all the servants broke out into loud laughter. At last Sir Hu and his wife came in, and the former said, My dear son-in-law, you may rest assured that my adopted daughter, who came to me while I was on my way to this place, is no ghost. Then Mo Su hastily fell on his knees and answered, I have sinned and beg for mercy. And he kowtowed without end. With that I have nothing to do, remarked Sir Hu, if our little daughter only gets along well with you, then all will be in order. But little golden daughter said, you heartless scoundrel. In the beginning you were poor and needy. We took you into our family, and let you study so that you might become somebody, and make a name for yourself. But no sooner had you become a Mandarin and a man of standing, than your love turned into enmity, and you forgot your duty as a husband and pushed me into the river. Fortunately, I found my dear adopted parents thereby. They fished me out, and made me their own child, otherwise I would have found a grave in the bellies of the fishes. How can I honorably live again with such a man as you? With these words she began to lament loudly, and she called him one hard-hearted scoundrel after another. Mosu lay before her, speechless with shame, and begged her to forgive him. Now when Sir Hu noticed that little golden daughter had sufficiently relieved herself by her scolding, he helped Mosu up and said to him, My dear son-in-law, if you repent of your misdeed, Little Golden Daughter will gradually cease to be angry. Of course you are an old married couple. Yet as you have renewed your vows this evening in my house, kindly do me a favor and listen to what I have to say. You, Mosu, are weighed with a heavy burden of guilt, and for that reason you must not resent your wife's being somewhat indignant, but must have patience with her. I will call in my wife to make peace between you. With these words Sir Hu went out and sent in his wife who finally, after a great deal of difficulty, succeeded in reconciling the two, so that they agreed once more to take up life as husband and wife. And they esteemed and loved each other twice as much as they had before. Their life was all happiness and joy. And later, when Sir Hu and his wife died, 
they mourned for them as if in truth they had been their own parents. Note, to marry into, as a rule, the wife enters the home of her husband's parents. But when there is no male heir, it is arranged that the son-in-law continues the family of his wife's parents, and lives in their home. The custom is still very prevalent in Japan, but it is not considered very honorable in China to enter into a strange family in this way. It is characteristic that Mosu, as a punishment for disdaining to marry into a family the first time, is obliged to marry into a second time the family of Sir Hu. The costume here described is still the wedding costume of China. Little golden daughter said, You heartless scoundrel! Despite her faithfulness, in accordance with Chinese custom, she is obliged to show her anger over his faithlessness. This is necessary before the matter can be properly adjusted, so that she may preserve her face. Thank you for joining us for today's fairy tale. We hope these stories bring joy and meaning to your day. If you love our channel, please hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any exciting tales. Wishing you a good night and sweet dreams. See you in the next story.